You know, we are all people committed to thorium. We are all people who probably resonate with each other. Of course, we have other dimensions of our activities, and so most of this debate arises out of those other dimensions. It would be very difficult to uh, basically handle all the minor actinide waste with the generation four systems. Uh, on a, in, uh, in the homogeneous way or heterogeneous way, it will be uh, still the transmutation efficiencies will be rather relatively low compared to what I've shown for a dedicated burner. Now, remember, minor actinides are, are uh, isotopes with a very low beta effective. So any gram of minor actinide that you introduce in these critical reactors will deteriorate the safety parameters. Therefore, if you really want to get rid of the minor actinide waste in an efficient way and safe way, I think ADS, or dedicated accelerator-driven subcritical systems, are uh, the technology uh, to be used. Well, you know, we'll not burn all the minor actinide. This is a physically impossible. So you will need, anyway, a deep geological repository. Many things, they will be discovered. And when the day they will discover that, we will be killed. Yes, okay. I think, I think promo promoting the sodium uh, technology today is also uh, a killer. But uh, I think this no, is I the am argument not, I am uh, not for not promoting you. sodium. Yes, uh, I, I know what minute, you want sir. to come wait to. Wait a minute, sir, yes. I didn't say that. I never mentioned that we will uh, uh, basically replace uh, the, deep, the need for, uh, eliminate the need, the need for deep geological repositories. I gave you some transmutation rate figures which are the result of simulations, of course, and uh, hopefully will be demonstrated. And from these figures, you can see that we are almost eliminating at the theoretical limits the minor actinides and the long lived fission product. So it's very clear. When you take this into consideration, you can calculate yourself what is the impact on the radiotoxicity and the reduction of the volume of the waste and what is necessary to be uh, deeply, uh, 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 how do you say, put on the ground. There Now, I would like to you to show me what is the type of transmutation rates that you can achieve for the minor actinides with this type of systems. And there we can compare, it has been a study by the OECD, it has been yes, compared, and studies. one of the conclusions is that this ADS, of course, this is why uh, France is uh, proposing or promoting this uh, double strata. You know, I'm not, I'm not promoting, result. I am not in so. a religion, you know. I'm not in a religion I'm not, either. I'm, a <laughs> I'm not a in a religion either. I am not representing a church. Yes. The NEA studies published in 1999 and then 2003, uh, 2003, the main conclusion, I just read it before, is that both systems have almost equivalent performances, recycling, uh, yes. particularly americium yes. in the blanket of fast breeder yes. reactor. The yes. ADS has no much more. Safety yes, first but break. you would have an impact on the safety parameters of these machines. And this you cannot deny, because as you correctly said two days ago, physics is physics. Yes, thank okay? you. Okay? So thank when you. you recycle minor actinides with the beta effective of, of 0.2% and with an impact on the void coefficient for these systems, okay, guarantee me that you can improve the safety. Okay. Go to the iodine 129. Please yes. come back. You are going to transmute iodine-129. Yes, in the blanket. Where, where will you find iodine-129? It no more exists. Do you know where it is? No. Where it is? Vitrified. No. In the release, in the normal release of the, of the reprocessing plant. Yes. So why do you put this one? Because if you consider the scheme that we have proposed, which is based on the uh, uh, reprocessing or the pyrochemical processes, basically in this stream, one can consider, instead of letting the iodine to, volati uh, to volatilize in the atmosphere, consider to recycle okay, this. But today and we have made a test, an experimental test okay, of this, with lead, lead iodine, and it transmutes very well. Today, you are trying to transmute something that doesn't exist. No, okay? but it could. If you, apply, if you apply the complete fuel cycle, I'm presenting a fuel cycle. So in this fuel cycle, when you operate this system in thorium, the iodine, if you apply the pyrochemical processes, could be re-injected in the system. I'm not telling you what I'm going to get rid of. If you have already get, got rid of the iodine, good for you. I'm telling you for the future, for those people who will install 
8,000 gigawatt electric, this, is, this system is proposing a solution for taking care of the iodine and the technetium that will be accumulated then. What about cesium-135? It is impossible to transmit it? Uh, we, haven't looked. We, have, we haven't looked at this in detail, of course. You will have to isotopically separate it from the one. When you try to transmit, you produce more cesium than the... You well, you can, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not here to answer. I mean, we can go through the whole list of uh, Mendeleev table, if you wish. We are conducting at the European scale, within Euratom, the ARCAS project, specifically dedicated to compare the burning or the transmuting of minor actinide in ADS solution, as well as in a critical sodium reactor being in homogeneous or heterogeneous. And in this comparison, what we are looking at is indeed the whole cycle, because there, it is not simply the amount of megawatt you need and amount of kilogram you burn, it's also the separation it's also the transport, and uh, when you are transporting those products, I mean, it is costly, especially if you have 50,000 people lying on the tra railway that you have to avoid to kill. And so these elements are taken in this study, and we think that we will finish this ARCAS comparison by the end uh, of this year, beginning next year. The results will be available and publicly uh, available for everyone. And the dismantling as well, for instance, you know how much it costs to dismantle Super Phoenix? We didn't yeah. take the dismantling because it is not part, this is for oh, the right. facilities. I mean, okay. that we don't take care Because dismantling something with irradiated sodium is, is quite expensive usually. Don't ask for one study yes, to be course. so global. We have yes. already taken so much in this comparison. I think it is re It'll be a reasonable one. Yes. It can be, be complemented by yes. other aspects. I, I think what you're proposing is a, a, a amplifier to supplement what's going on in the, in the usual sense of things here. Generation 4 is coming with fast reactors, but you're proposing that we should put as an objective transportation as a high objective. Yes. And that's what you should state, that this is a high objective for the industry and for future that it should be. Well, uh, it should not be combined as, as it should be number one objective here that, right. we, that the industry should think about reducing the you know, time for uh, solving the waste problem by reducing the time it has to be put into, into repositories, this energy amplifier and, and a, a, with subcritical core that it, it would supplement the other system of reducing the actinides also. So this is not, not a uh, not the only solution, it is a supplemental solution. It's not only a supplemental solution, it is also a comparable solution. Because okay. for the thorium, it, I still insist, it, it, for the thorium, bringing the thorium yeah, fuel, the thorium is, fuel is a good you idea. Need, you as need a, this system. As I was saying on the first day, that it's a good idea to yeah. bring a thorium also as a supplemental system okay. because we shouldn't depend only on one. On one. With regard to, mm, to the deployment of ADS for thorium utilization, uh, if you have a K effective plan that, let's say, 0.98 or 99, as we saw, then, then it, it's practically a critical reactor from the breeding point of view, and it has it offers no advantage whatsoever uh, over a critical reactor. On the other hand, if you talk of uh, reactors which are much lower in K effective, they would have advantage in terms of breeding. So, so if if we are going to expand uh, the thorium program, you cannot do it without breeding, and either you go through the plutonium route as we are doing in India. Or you have a, a, a bypass route, suppose you want, for utilizing thorium, then you have to have breeders which work at much smaller K effectives, either in once through or in uh, recycling modes. I completely disagree with you, because of, there is a major difference between being critical and subcritical. So whether it's 0 0.99 or 0 0.995, as you say, because this, of course, subcriticality gives you safety margins, and these safety margins are very important, basically, in order to give you the flexibility in utilizing the type of fuels or the different fuels that you want Sorry. to use. <laughs> and it was yeah. shown as well, I think, by Jean-Pierre Revol, that the response of a critical system and a subcritical system to a reactivity insertion is very dependent. 
on the subcriticality level and the response, of course. And the response, yes, it is. My name's Ed Pyle. I guess I disagree with uh, having the transmutation even as a primary objective. The, th the three big problems that we have in the reactor industry are reducing the cost of the systems, uh, getting rid of dispersive mechanisms in the systems, and elim eliminating the problem of decay heat. Um, transmutation is not really a big issue, and criticality is not a big issue. We, don't, we simply don't have problems with criticality, and that adds to the cost of the overall system. So, and, and that's a large factor in maintaining reactor systems. As far as transmuting systems, the building that we are in right now is probably large enough to store the entire amount of minor actinides that we have in the entire world. The half-life of minor actinides is 10,000 years. You can bury all of Geneva in toxic waste that have a half-life that's infinite. So I don't really see the issues associated with going to an ADS system that increases the costs and gets rid of two problems that, that aren't the major problems in the nuclear industry. Well, uh, I'm surprised to hear uh, this from you, but okay, this is the point of nuclear industry, that you're not worried about nuclear waste and proliferation or aspects or whatever, uh, plutonium, yes, because you have to transport, so this is... I am, interest, I am interested in uh, elimination of nuclear waste. Yeah. I think we, the, the general way of getting rid of waste in the first place is to not produce yes. it. Yeah. not to not focus on getting rid of, creating it to be able to get rid of it. Yeah. So however, however here in Europe, we have, we have a different situation that we have nuclear waste, and it is a societal uh, issue, and by law. So there was a law passed in 1990 where we are obliged to look at what to do with the nuclear waste, and that includes deep uh, geological repository and transmutation, right. so partitioning and transmutation. Issue, it's not a technical issue. It is a technical issue. Uh, I would defy you to transmute whatever, all this waste in the present uh, systems. The anti-nuclear community really presses the nuclear community on, can the reactor go critical and blow up like a bomb? And the accelerator community is acceding to the, the anti-nuclear community's um, desire to prove that these reactors are unsafe by saying, yes, the reactor could go critical, so let's not Go, let it go critical and we'll use the accelerator to provide that, that uh, safety margin. As far as a criticality event due to accident, uh, AD, ADS doesn't really have that up on thermal reactors, right? Because yeah. it just doesn't seem very likely that you're going to have that kind of a situation in a thermal reactor. Well, uh, another thing is if we've designed the reactor, as we should, with a strongly negative temperature coefficient, it will be strongly self-controlling. Reactors want to be critical. If they have strong negative temperature coefficients, if they're subcritical, they want to be critical. If they're supercritical, they want to be critical. It's almost like a plane that has a, a built-in uh, control mechanism to where if it goes in a dive, it wants to level out. If it goes up, it wants to level out. Stable it's, it's stable equilibrium, yeah, dynamically stable system. It's a claim everywhere that ADS are very safe. I said that this morning. You know, it's make me very angry, you know. The, when you have a fission, you have two fission products. Okay, the two fission products release energy, whatever the system is, whatever the system. And this makes the residual power. If there was not this, there, was, there would not, not be Fukushima, TMI, or even, well, Chernobyl was another problem, but anyway. Uh, everywhere you are still the residual power, even in ADS. For a given amount of energy, one fission is 200 MeV, is neutrons, and is Release of, of uh, residual power, free things fission, you know, is physics. So you have to remove the residual power, otherwise you go to the big accident. That's as simple as this. Of course, you can imagine uh, more, or less, uh, more or less efficient as is air-cooled or uh, in ADS, which, which is a fine idea, but don't tell me that much safer or less safer than that. You, may, you can imagine systems, as it was imagined by ADS, air cool, natural air cooling systems, or even, which are better. If you say it is safer, you are, you are going to remove the containment, and you are going to, put, to go to the safety authority saying, well, I have ultra safe reactor, I don't need a containment. You know the answer.
reactor criticality has not ever been an issue in the nuclear industry as far as commercial reactors goes. The only times that they've really gone critical were personnel errors or specifically blocking out the insertion of the control rods. Um, if you don't allow that to happen, which most nuclear industries do not do, then criticality is not an issue and, and never has been. So calling, saying that you need an accelerator to solve a criticality issue that doesn't really exist is basically acceding to the anti-nuclear's demands that it could go critical and blow up. And that's really not the case. If the temperature increase, the reactivity should decrease. So nobody will ever be allowed to build a system with a positive uh, temperature coefficient. Now why isn't that in itself enough? ADS would deploy that, all reactors going forward would deploy that. I think in, in principle that should be enough uh, if you can make sure that the, uh, the, the, the system remains subcritical all the time, which is the case, excuse me. Uh, the first thing you'd say when you're describing the importance of ADS is say it's safe, safety. Yeah, safety first. I mean, the only reason people don't like nuclear energy is, is safety. People keep saying that thorium won't take off until it becomes price competitive with, yeah. with uranium. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right. And I think an analogy that you could use is that we didn't move from horses to cars because cars were cheaper than horses. We did it because cars do something different. They become, they give us a more flexibility. They allow us to do different things. It's performance. And when you start with the market and then say, right, from the market, this back gives customer requirements. If you reach uh, an equilibrium of price, then the thing will, will that, th there's a tipping point. Investment in the research to get us to that stage should actually take place outside the market. There's a real reason in, in any country for investing in fundamental research because you've got the possibility then, if that research leads to a product that the rest of the world wants to buy, which is much further down the line, you're actually developing an industry for that country. You're developing something that you can export. Well, if you're um, if, you, if you're lucky. You're lucky. There's, a, there's a limit to which market forces can achieve things. You've got to look at China, for example. Yes. Now, they've got plenty of coal, but they've got serious pollution problems, and, and market forces will keep driving them down the, the coal route. It's only the decision by government to look at nuclear power as a way of getting them out of this hole. Thorium is more proliferation resistant. Uh, that's agreeable, but then I also feel that uh, if proliferation resistance, uh, I don't find it a very good, uh, it doesn't have a very strong point because the hard energy, uh, high energy gammas can anyhow be shielded and the job can be done for whatever it, it can be done. Or alternatively, one can also denature the plutonium. So, I, I mean, I would say it is more of a political uh, point than, than any of a scientific point. Uh, I agree with uh, your remark. You can try to make it difficult, complex from the technical point of view. It stays a political issue. To my opinion, indeed, we have to make it technically complicated. But if one is willing to do that, I mean, it can be deviated. If we continue to build nuclear plants one at a time uh, and sporadically, yeah. that's intrinsically going to increase the cost. Whether we do it with conventional nuclear or whether we do it with thorium or, or molten salt, yeah. doing things one at a time is in, invariably going to increase the cost. Yeah. We're, we're building essentially a whole string of prototypes. I, you can't make one accelerator drone system which is reliable, you cannot copy it. Naturally, people don't design accelerators to break down, but the point is that they don't design them for reliability to be the primary goal. The primary goal, for example, in the case of LHC that we have here, is the energy. Um, the primary goal of uh, the ESS accelerator is to deliver the appropriate number of protons onto the target in the right bun shape. They want reliability, but it, that reliability doesn't have to be 100%. 95% is fine. And we can approach those 95% reliabilities. But each one of these accelerators is a prototype. Each one yeah. is built uniquely. And it's designed for one, to a, a unique specification. And, and, and it's tweaked and it's touched and it's uh, optimized as time goes on. Whereas on the other hand, 
if we said what we really want is reliability as the major criteria, you would actually build an accelerator in a slightly different way. I mean, for example, as we are trying to do with the FFAGs, but we're also using accelerators constantly for irradiation purposes, for treatment of food, sterilization, for even for packaging. Those accelerators are perfectly reliable because you're mass producing them. You've ironed out all of the quirks that you have in a prototype. In all reactors which foreseen recycling of the fuel, multi-recycling and closing the fuel cycle, the produced waste will mainly depend on the efficiency of reprocessing methods. So if you want to compare how efficient is sodium cooled reactor, MSR, uh, ADS, you should really look on your reprocessing method and how efficient it is, because this will determine what will go to the final repository. It's more or less just a comment. Yeah, yeah well, that, it's true that the efficiency of the reprocessing is uh, an element, because the uh, it's obvious, but that's not the only element. And if you want to compare what a uh, uranium uh, plutonium system can do in terms of, uh, of, a, uh, of a, for example, uh, actinite or whatever incineration to an ADS system, I mean, the uh, rate at which you can actually uh, burn uh, th those uh, elements depends on the physical properties of the system. And there, you have a major difference between the two. So the efficiency of reprocessing is an element, but it's certainly not an element. I think uh, okay. Professor Rubia would like to make a comment on this. It seems to me that uh, uh, many things which have been discussed today are in total contradiction to what I've tried to explain in my presentation, which, by the way, doesn't seem to be penetrating the mind of the people because I haven't heard any comment on this so far. Maybe it's going to come later. Yeah. But anyway, let me tell you what I think. First of all, you do not need to do reprocessing with thorium. Thorium reprocessing is an extremely complicated and difficult system because many of the activities with thorium are making life and the cost much higher than what it is normally with ordinary system. This is why I thought that the right thing to do is not make fuel reprocessing, but making fuel regeneration. I am repeating what I already said at the beginning. Namely, it seems to me that we have the fortunate circumstances, the only object that we really use as a sea is uranium. Uranium can be easily separated by uh, fluorination in a very simple way, which is in fact used by the large majority of people it, when you are, in fact, most of the uh, depleted uranium now is in the form of extra fluoride. Extra fluorization is an extremely simple process which can be done in very short time and is not uh, something it's very complicated. So, in my view, which is, of course, in contradiction to all the other people presented here, it seems to me that you should preserve the uranium as a seed and consider everything else is waste, including the thorium itself, because thorium is super cheap. And adding thorium after so 150, 120, 130 gigawatt a ton uh, is, uh, of course, a very small extra cost compared to the rest. So I would simply take uranium and fluorinate it, take it out, it becomes a seed, take everything else and call it waste. Now, in that waste, there, are, there is one element which can be uh, replaced, which is essentially uh, the, present, the, the few actinides which can be replaced, in particular the question of, of protactinium, which can be separated, protactinium, not the, not the protactinium-231, which is long-lived, which can be separated with magnesium, so it's a very simple operation. And that would allow you to do something in a, in a much, much simpler, cheaper and, and most uh, reliable. I'm surprised that everybody continues still to think about reprocessing in the old-fashioned old way. The information concerning concerning uh, fluoride volatility, fluoride uh, f concerning flu fluoridization technology, I'm involved in the uh, research and development of this technology for more than 30 years. So, uh, Nuclear Research Institute is long time the only workplace when f uh, where fluoride volatility is under development. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I must say. The reactions on the paper looks very easy, but uh, mastering industrialization of, of this technology is extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, and moreover, uh, I would like to say that this technology, I mean fluoride volatility, uh, based on fl separation, uh, 
of the spent fuel in the form of, of fluorides based on different volatility system is suitable only for uranium based fuels. This technology cannot be applied absolutely for thorium based fuels uh, in, in this uh, basis as we know as fluoride volatility. Okay, thank you. You, you want to respond? I say it's not true. That's yeah. Uh, Professor Rubia disagrees with this. Because nothing is perfect, I would like to ask if at least we can agree both MSR and IDS will need at least reduced containment. We have already designed, built and licensed a first ADS with lead in front of the Belgian licensing authority. Indeed, you need safety studies to license any nuclear facility. Not more not less than the other system. We are preparing the licensing of Mira, 100 megawatt ADS. It is not, we are playing alone in our offices. It's with the licensing authority with whom we have put a pre-licensing project for this project with a series of studies and experiments in support of this which are already running. I can tell you that we are going to make transient on the fuel of Mira in a pulsed reactor because we have to put that in front of the licensing. So, I mean, you should not, I mean, think that we are joking. Sometimes we have to stay realistic, we know, but we are doing the job correctly. And I think we have not to say that, well, like if those guys are simply dreamers, I think they are addressing the key question correctly. Just add to that, that one of the things that I think we probably missed out on at this conference is um, a talk by the licensing authorities themselves. I would love to know what we do to move forward the licensing issues with almost all of the new systems that we've discussed at this meeting. I had a rather bizarre conversation at one stage and it went something like, I would like to know how to license an accelerator driven subcritical system. And the answer was, well, we can't license it. And when I asked why, they said, well, because we haven't built one. Yeah, I will it, tell it, you... And it's, it's, that seems to be the conversation. But when you have a licensing authority who has to do the job, yeah. and when you have a project on the table that has to, de to do the licensing, people of the licensing are also rational people, able to think with you, as long as you are considering their questions as rational ones, from the point of view of the licensing, they have to care about the safety and security of the population, you have to care about the operation of your system and a safe operation. You are also not willing that that facility that you are building, the first responsible of safety or uh, security of a facility is the operator actually. Right. And so I think we have done a pre-licensing project for Guinevere. We have done a pre-licensing project with our licensing authority for Mira and this is working in perfect harmony, and they are willing to license it. Am I right in assuming that the licensing is progressive and that you've been, been given the steps that you have to go through? Yes, yeah. and there have also rules, and the WENRA rules are the one we are following for the MIRA. Yeah, I think we all agree that ADS has, has gone a much longer way towards licensing than molten salt systems. Some people, not that many, fortunately, claim that ADS is zero risk <coughs> facility. It was written on one of the slides. When you, when you see that on the newspaper, when you say that in the, for the man in the street, zero risk facility, you find this kind of discussion. Do you need a containment or not? Of course we need. You will never license any nuclear facility without a containment. Uh, if the efficiency of accelerator keep at 20%, the future of ADS is very low. When it is 50, as people of India say, in this case, you have a huge, or more than 50%, it, it has a huge future. The crucial parameter, I think, is the efficiency of the... Uh, the other parameters are more technological, but that is, there are perhaps physical limits, 
about the efficiency. If there are effi physical limits on efficiency, it means there are perhaps no future for ADS. When you go to a higher power stored in the beam, you go towards higher efficiencies. I don't know exactly what the limit uh, will be, but uh, there are a number of, of people who are con confident that uh, high efficiencies can be obtained. My, Mike, you might want to yes, make a comment on this. So really high efficiency above 50 percent is, is probably very difficult or physically not possible, right? Because what you have to do is you take power from the grid, you convert it to a, uh, to a DC voltage, there you lose already 5 to 10 percent, and you convert to RF power, the best klystrons have 65 percent of efficiency, and then you transfer it to the beam where you again lose some factor. So if you multiply this all together, it's very difficult to get above 50 percent. But I think uh, you can compensate this with the right choice of this criticality value. So you, in your first slide you were mentioning ESS as a good example of a modern machine which produces uh, lots of megawatts, but okay, actually ESS is a 2.5 GV machine. So I'm not sure, at least to my knowledge, that uh, reactor, our reactor colleagues would like to have 2.5 GV beam in their reactor. If you decrease uh, ESS to energy level, which we have heard about, which is uh, one GV or so, then you will be left with two megawatts, which is uh, the energy scale, which you get from fixed field rings, okay? Like your ring in PSI. We need, we need uh, a, uh, ADS uh, accelerator review, because we know it's going to cost uh, of the order of 10% of the reactor power. So I think this meeting needs uh, Serious uh, accelerator review. Our design is aiming at finding a solution for a very simple ADS driver. But what I mean by simple? As simple, simple for me is monostage machine. A single stage machine, very easy to operate. Not tedious matching between different stages, etc. etc. This is something that we have to avoid. Even for even for cyclotron is possible. All the infrastructures that have been built in the last 15 years in Europe about the lead bismuth technology, which was only dedicated for the ADS. We have built already one zero power ADS. We have a plan funded for 40% of 1 billion euro project in Europe. The problem is that we don't want to federate ourselves, and I would like to thank Mike with what he said that Projects which are ongoing, we don't have to question them. But it doesn't mean that this solution adopted for that particular project are the right solutions for the industrialization. And in that sense, I think the effort that have been shown by Pierre on the accelerator makes sense. And the question that we're addressing, is this efficiency important or not? I think, yes, it's very important. I said to answer on the specific case of Mira, how we are dealing and what, the, what is the realism that we are taking in that project. 10% efficiency, I can afford it. If I got already 18 or 15, I'm happy. If I get 30, I'm happier. But for the industrial scale, we have to go better for sure. We need the K-effective that allow us to operate in a safe in all conditions. If this is 0.99, it is the right K effective. There is no, uh, I would say, magic in there. What we need is safe operation of the ADS, whatever K effective it is. We said for Mira, we start with 0.95 and it comes to the licensing issue. You are in a learning process with your safety authority. So don't challenge them more than needed and that's what we are doing. Uh, I think molten salt is a mistake. I think molten salt requires fixing in a liquid co container both the uh, fission fragments, the, uh, but the uh, liquid itself and all the waste coming out of the system. It is 10 to the 10 curies produced by an ordinary reactor which of course sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a bottle which is sitting liquid inside a container of unspecified and unclear position because obviously you can have an earthquake or something else and things can change and so forth and so on. I think uh, molten salt is not necessary. It seems to me the so classic solution 
or using standard pins and using the system which is well used in ordinary reactor is a solution. If you consider this within the framework of a public opinion, reactor community should realize that now things have to be different. And now I can see that most of these presentations here are just the same old story rehashed again with the word thorium on top. It doesn't seem to be enough. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Rubia uh, said that and, and you know, of course, I fundamentally disagree. I think uh, molten salt carrying fuel is far safer than existing uh, nuclear technologies because we would be able to uh, remove the driving forces for uh, the release of radiation. We'd get rid of all the stored energy term problems that we look at in today's reactors, whether it's pressure, whether it's chemical reactivity, uh, e even the potential of the fission products in the fuel itself to be released. Uh, in fluoride fuel, which is what we would use in a molten salt reactor, those fission products are bound up very tightly in, in, in salts, in a, in a salt formulation, where they're not volatile, they're not going to release to the environment. And that's a major, major advantage. Is it kind of odd then that there's so many people in the, that are throwing proponents and they, there's so much disagreement within that community itself, it's kind of hard to imagine what the um, different conceptions of things might be outside of the thorium community. <laughs> my, my experience at NASA was good preparation for this because I've seen engineers go in a room and agree about 97% of something and argue to the death about the last 3%, you know, so I'm, I'm used to uh, engineers and technical people and scientists throwing rocks at each other, even when any normal person would look and go, wow, you guys are in broad agreement about the most important aspects of what you're working on.